I'm Julie Pace, Washington Bureau Chief for the Associated Press, and this is Ground Game. The coronavirus pandemic ranks among one of the most consequential stories ever covered by the Associated Press in its 170-year history. Here to take you inside the outbreak is AP's Ralph Russo. From the Associated Press, this is Inside the Outbreak. I'm Ralph Russo. Today is Wednesday, May 13th. Around the world, coronavirus clusters have popped up and caused some countries to reinstate restrictions to prevent a second wave of infections. Authorities in Wuhan, China, where the pandemic first began, reportedly were pressing ahead to test all 11 million residents within 10 days after a handful of new infections were found. In Lebanon, Authorities have reinstated a nationwide lockdown for four days after a spike in reported infections. And in Europe, there's a debate brewing about how to boost a battered tourism industry. Today on Inside the Outbreak, we'll speak with Dr. Tom Inglesby, who's an expert on public health crises. Dr. Inglesby is the director of the Center for Health Security at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. We'll talk about where the United States stands now in the fight against COVID-19 and whether movements to reopen parts of the country are supported by the data. Plus, we'll discuss the delicate balance between controlling the spread of the disease and trying to stabilize the economy. Dr. Tom Inglesby is the director of the Center for Health Security of the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The Center for Health Security is dedicated to protecting people from epidemics and disasters. Tom is also a member of Maryland Governor Larry Hogan's Coronavirus Task Force. Dr. Inglesby, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, It's great to be with you, Ralph. So I'd I'd like to spend most of our time looking at where we are and where we're headed in the fight against COVID-19, but I don't think I can do that well without at least taking a glance backward. Uh, Could you give me your assessment of the United States' response to the pandemic? How have we done compared with other countries? Well, uh, I think we've had uh, some initial missteps and then a a real sharp ramping up of effort uh, around the country. Um, I think we lost a little bit of time at the beginning of the response, but um, now there's there's much more engagement across the public health, medical, clinical community, the governor's offices, the federal agencies are much more... um, engaged um, across the board. So I think going backwards, there are things we wish we might have done differently, certainly around diagnostics, around using the time in January to do more more preparing. Um, but I think it's, it's good, as you say, to kind of focus on what we should be doing going forward. And we will have time to look back and think about how we might react differently the next time. So right now we have this I'll use the word patchwork response of states reopening on different timetables. And that gives the suggestion that we are getting the outbreak under control. Uh, But Dr. Anthony Fauci told uh, a Senate committee that uh, he's somewhat cautious and somewhat, um, I guess maybe the word worried might be good to use there, about being too quick to open up. do, do our actions match the data? Let's, let's, let's refine it to that question. Do the actions of what we're seeing with some states opening up, does it match the data? So um, I think the four most important conditions for a less risky reopening of states, businesses, and activities are the following. A two-week decline in cases, the capacity to care for COVID patients in the state's healthcare system without having to resort to crisis standards of care or allocation of scarce resources. The third is the ability to diagnose widely all patients who might have COVID, not just the sickest or the ones that are in nursing homes, but anyone who has symptoms that might be COVID. And the fourth is to have a strong contact tracing program in place where all the contacts of cases can be identified and quarantined and we break the chains of transmission. If you look around the country, people are, states are in different places in all of the in all of those metrics. So a small, a relatively small number of, of states have 
had a two week decline, something on the order of nine or 10 states have had that decline. And they would be um, certainly have met that that White House criteria and that that gating criteria that was established. And some of them actually have very low numbers on a day to day basis. For example, Hawaii has single digit numbers of cases and is tracking every case very carefully. Other states in the country ha- still have hundreds of new cases every day, every single day, new, hundreds of new cases appear. So the state, the, the states are in a very different place. And I think Dr. Fauci is, is uh, absolutely right to say that we should be going um, ahead with eyes wide open very carefully. I, it's not correct to say that this pandemic will be our, in our rearview mirror in May or June. This virus has not changed since it arrived. It's still a virus that is quite transmissible and uh, can cause serious illness and in a very small percent of people can cause death. So I think we, as we're thinking about reopening, the first message is that we still will all need to be very mindful of the power of this virus. We should still all be uh, mindful of physical distancing and staying six feet apart when you're not with your family. We should still all be wearing cloth masks when we're in public as an act of generosity to others, because the mask will help us decrease the likelihood that we will accidentally spread it to others. We should be avoiding gatherings. We know that gatherings like birthday parties, funerals, church gatherings are the places where this virus has found a way to spread easily. And we should be telecommuting where we can to, again, decrease the number of people that are interacting that can spread the virus to each other. I do think that we we need to to find a way to to reopen the economy as as best we can. Uh, we've had horrific job loss and economic downturn since this started. So I, I certainly agree with investigating all possibilities and moving ahead as 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 best we can. But if we do it too quickly or in ways where we don't have those conditions in place, we could see a rapid reacceleration of the epidemic in a state that could put it, set us backwards, not only cause sickness and, and death, but also set us backwards in terms of, of our recovery. So that I think we need to move forward slowly, as Dr. Fauci was saying. How, how challenging is it just to navigate this outbreak with our system of government. And what I mean by that is we do not necessarily have a a strict top-down approach, right? The states and local authorities have a lot of power. And and to a certain degree, that that seems like a great idea because the the virus is acting differently and affecting different places differently. So you want them to have the freedom to be able to act in what's best, their best interest. But in other countries, it seems like there is more of a top-down approach, right? Where, where, where the federal government will step in and say, we are doing this and everybody has to fall in line. So does the challenges of having just federalism, is federalism a problem for handling an outbreak? It, it's probably, you, I would say it's both a, a weakness and a strength. Uh, I think the weakness side of it is that uh, other countries which have taken a centralized approach to purchasing uh, personal protective equipment and to navigating diagnostics, they can act more centrally, strategically in terms of distribution, assessing needs, moving things around. <clears throat> and I think we should have done more of that. We are doing some of that, but a lot of it is being left to states to try and find their own access to diagnostics and equipment which I think is is very hard and sets up competition. So there are certainly um, there are weaknesses to the way that we're operating as compared to other countries. I think the strength of it is that we're a very large country and that different parts of the country have different burdens of disease. They have different uh, numbers of people. They have different ways of operating. And there are places, for example, um, Montana has had a lot of success in controlling uh, the spread of its virus, um, as has Idaho, as has Vermont, as has Vermont. And in those places, it does make sense to, to think about their risks differently. There is much less risk currently of community transmission. It's not to say that virus couldn't 
again, cause big problems in those states. But at least at this point, they're starting in a different place than some of the states in the country, which have a much higher number of cases. So I think the states should have autonomy in terms of deciding how they reopen and deciding on their own practices. But in terms of technology acquisition or assets, moving critical assets around the country, I think we we would benefit more from a centralized a centralized approach, a centralized strategy. Uh, you mentioned before that you are very much in favor of trying to get things opened up in a cautious way to get the economy rolling. I feel like there has been almost, um, I, I don't know if this is necessarily true, but I think it can some, sometimes be framed this way that the public health officials are solely concerned about managing the virus and government officials are solely concerned about getting the economy running. I don't think that's true, but I think sometimes it is framed that way. As a public health official, how do you weigh things like, hey, listen, the, if the economy struggles, that's not good for public health either? Oh, that's so true. I mean, so much of, of, uh, of what's going on now is really is hardship related to the shutdown and people uh, not being able to pay their bills, be able or not being able to access the usual medical care that they that they receive, um, not being able to take care of their families. So there, it's certainly related. Economic downturn can have terrible public health consequences. And so I think most public health officials would say that they would like to see the economy started as as quickly as it as it can be. But you're right. I think we need to do have both of these things in our minds at the same time. It's not one or the other. And if if, for example, decisions are made to reopen the economy um, without respect to what's happening with the virus and its ability to spread, then I think what's we're, we're at high risk of happening again is acceleration of spread uh, and. In that case, I think we're not going to get to a healthy economy in any event. What people want is to feel like the virus is under control. Even if it's not under complete control, we know that it may not be under complete control until we have a vaccine. And I know people are, are going to be going to have to be able to, to tolerate a level of risk. But if it's clear within a given state that we don't know how the virus is getting transmitted, that there are many cases, there are too many cases to track on a given day, that numbers are going up in our hospitals. People are not going to have confidence to go out and start buying things in the economy the way they used to do, or sitting in restaurants, or restarting the kinds of activities that they that help drive the economy. In places in the world where they have good control of this of this disease. They don't have complete control. They continue to have disease, but it's a, at a very low number of cases per day. They are beginning to reopen their businesses and schools and getting things going. And I think that should be our goal. We, we are going to need to live with some level of disease transmission in this country until we have a vaccine. But hopefully it can be a very low level of disease and the risk to any individual on a given day is going to be low. Um, but right now, in some places in the country, there is just so much disease still still moving around that the risk isn't low. And I don't think economy the economies are going to come back strongly until we get better better control and and diagnostics and contact tracing. That kind of capacity is what's going to help us get there. So I want to ask you a question about um, an ailment that has been sort of mysterious and frightening. Uh, but also rare, uh, and I'll I'll give you the entire scientific term as of as of right now. Uh, pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, we're seeing it in very young COVID nineteen patients, but again, it's been very rare. Can you tell us what you know about it, and I, I guess something of a level of concern that we should have with this. Yeah, I think it is quite concerning. I mean, the, the if there's been any silver lining with this terrible virus. It's been that it has inf it has made relatively few children seriously ill. It has unfortunately uh, resulted in the deaths of some small number of children, 
and made some kids very, very sick and hospitalized. But compared to adults, it's a very, very small risk. And um, that's been that's been the you know, kind of the, the the bit of good news as we've been moving through the pandemic. In the last week, or a bit more than a week, we've begun to hear more about this syndrome that you described, and uh, it's very familiar. Sounds very similar to a disease which we call Kawasaki disease, which is a uncommon disease in kids. It affects uh, uh, blood vessels within the body um, primarily, um, but can have a variety of effects, and it can cause kids to get very sick. And uh, it can be lethal. Three three children in New York have died of this disease. We don't know its uh, complete connection with COVID, although it appears that at this point it does seem to have a connection with COVID. I think that's we're, we're trying to understand that more clearly at this point. Um, but what it means is that parents should have a low threshold for calling their pediatrician if their kids have new rash, new swollen hands, swollen feet, um, uh, chap lips, other things that could be signs of this unusual illness and get their kids seen by their pediatrician uh, early to see if this might be going on. And I, I think that the bigger picture is that it, it keeps showing us that this virus, uh, that we have a lot to learn about this virus. It wasn't even a few weeks ago, we learned that this virus had caused a series of strokes in, in young adults in New York City in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, which is a very unusual age to have a stroke unless you have some under, underlying condition that predisposes you to it. And so I think we're still learning a lot about this virus, what, how it affects the body. Initially, we really focused on its, its uh, ability to cause very serious disease of the lungs. And then we learned about its ability to cause um, heart infections. And then we've learned more about its ability to affect other organ systems. And I think this is one more example of that the more time we have with this virus, the more that we see its unusual manifestations, sometimes life-threatening manifestations uh, in people. And we're going to keep learning about it, unfortunately, as we go on. Okay. One last question for you, Dr. Inglesby, and it has to do not just with the fight against COVID-19, but sort of a, a worldview here of uh, how, has the, how has the fight against COVID-19 impacted the fight against other infectious diseases? They have not gone away. Uh, and, and that's around the world in this country. Uh, what ground, if any, is being lost in the fights against other infectious diseases that could be so deadly? Yeah, it's a really important question. Uh, and unfortunately, we are losing ground in the fight against other childhood diseases in other parts of the world, especially, but also in the United States, where we're seeing uh, programs in, internationally, we're seeing programs that are uh, designed to to get kids their whole um, range of childhood life saving childhood vaccines. We're seeing those programs interrupted because of difficulty protecting staff in the field or deploying staff into the field who usually do that work, or they have been, been diverted to to help um, fight COVID nineteen um, or um, or working on other problems related to the virus. So. I think it's a serious issue. I think uh, in the United States, there's also the the, the trouble with um, people being uh, worried about going to see their doctors, worried about getting sick when they're in the doctor's office or at a hospital. Uh, many offices have been closed for a period of time since the start of this as part of the stay-at-home orders. I think one of the early things that should be happening in the United States with the reopening is the resumption of medical services wherever it's safe to do that, wherever there's not an overload in the system uh, at a hospital or wherever doctor's offices have access to the right personal protective equipment. We want doctors uh, to be able to see patients in the way that they were before uh, so they can resume their colonoscopies, their, if they've had cancer treatment interrupted, if they haven't been able to get in and get their vaccinations. We want those things to resume because we, what we don't want is for this virus to also compound other medical problems that already existed or, or to get in the way of prevention programs. So it's as a high priority in the reopening process, we really do want to focus on getting those things closer to normal again as quickly as can safely be done. 
Dr. Tom Inglesby is the director of the Center for Health Security of the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is also a member of the Coronavirus Task Force for the state of Maryland. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today, providing such great insight. Please stay healthy, stay safe, and good luck with all your work. Thanks so much, Ralph. At APNews.com, today's One Good Thing feature is a story about concerts from the driveway. Adam Chester is a pianist, composer, and singer. His normal job is surrogate for Elton John, playing the rock legend's parts with his band in rehearsals and sound checks. The coronavirus outbreak has been a showstopper. So Adam has been giving a series of Saturday evening concerts from his driveway with just a keyboard and microphone. His fan base is porch bound neighbors on his Southern California cul-de-sac. You can read that story and all of AP's coronavirus outbreak coverage at APNews.com. That's it for this episode of Ground Game. We'll be here every step of the way during this extraordinary moment in American politics and American life, giving you all the news you need to know. Be sure to tell a friend about us and please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Some of the details of our discussion may have changed by the time you hear this. For up-to-date developments on all of your news, head over to APNews.com. From the Westwood One Podcast Network.